Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is your favorite gun channel in beautiful, bright, Hanglish language. And today is a special day because I have three important information to announce to you. First of all, a new series of videos is starting today. This is the first episode. It will be a good old-fashioned question and answer video. So if you have any question to Captain Ball, then please ask it in the pin post here on YouTube at the comment section or at our Patreon page. If you are a Patreon supporter, your question will surely be answered. And I will do my best to answer as many questions as possible from my YouTube subscribers as well. Second, I'm very happy to announce that Cap and Ball finally has a second leg. We have a safe place on the net. As you know, Google is not really friendly with firearms related contents and getting through the AI regarding monetization is sometimes impossible. So I was very happy to accept the invitation of History of Weapons and War platform. That's a new platform. It's a paid platform. That is a very good place for any kind of firearms related content. So here I will be able to post all the content that was not possible on YouTube. This new platform assembled eight of the best educational YouTube creators and they already have 4,500 videos online for you. This is a paid content channel, but we have Forgotten Weapons, we have the Armorers Bench, Block on the Range, British Muzzle Loaders, Royal Armories, Legacy Collectibles, Nine Hole Reviews and Cap and Balls Online. The Cap and Ball YouTube channel has now all the valuable part uploaded to this platform as well. This new platform is accessible on iOS, on Android, but you can also watch it on PC or you can watch it on your TV as well. This is an ad-free paid platform that is also supporting the creators of the channels. So please visit weaponsandwar.tv and if you're interested, let's start the journey here as well. Third, there are changes on the Patreon page as well. I will be much more active there and time by time you will find exclusive content there that is not really liked by Google. So if you're searching for exclusive content about hunting with historical firearms and target shooting with them, then this will be a good place for you. But now let's jump to the questions and answer part. This will be a series that I will do in every two weeks. So if you have any questions to me, as I said before, please ask it in the comment section in the pinned post. Let's start with the first question. This is coming from Marlene, a Patreon supporter, and he asked this post under the video about long range shooting, the World Championships. And the question is, is the same diameter bullet used for both double wrap and the chase patch, with different thickness of paper used to arrive to the same patch diameter? The key information here is your bore diameter. To determine this, you have to slug your bore. This means that you have to push a slightly oversized pure lead slug into the muzzle of your rifle and you have to pull it out. Now measure the smallest diameter that you can measure on this. This will arrive to the bore diameter or the length to length diameter. Your paper patch bullet cannot be larger than this, otherwise you will not be able to load it freely into your muzzle. So when I'm determining the necessary paper thickness, I keep the following method. So I slug my bore and I deduct the diameter of my smooth sided paper patch bullet from this. Now, the result is divided by four if I wrap the bullet with two layers of paper. If I only wrap it once because it's a chase patch, then I only divide it by two. But when I'm using a single layer patching, I actually have a second chance also. I can just use a larger diameter bullet as well. It does not really matter. So you can use a thin paper with a larger diameter bullet or a thicker paper with a smaller diameter bullet. You will arrive to the same conclusion that it must not be bigger than your land to land diameter, so you can easily load it into your bore. The next question arrived from Peter Starr, a Patreon supporter, and he commented this to the video that I made about paper patching the bullets, an exclusive content that you can check on Patreon. I wonder if there's any reason to go with one direction of rotation or the other with the paper, depending on the twist direction of the rifling. Perhaps the leading edge of the paper might sit more consistently while being rammed down. That's an interesting question also. So the question here is about, does it make a difference if I start wrapping the paper to the right direction or into the opposite direction on my bullet? I also had this in mind when I started paper patching my bullets. And to tell you the truth, it does not make any difference. If you did your job properly and followed the instructions and your paper is tight enough on the bullet, well, it just won't make any difference, really. But your paper must have a perfect fit on your bullet. So when you push it down in the bore and when you're shooting it out, it cannot move. If you lose your paper in the bore, which means that you push down the bullet and you feel that from a certain point it gets very, very easy, 
That's, that means usually that the paper is detached from the bullet. Well, never fire that bullet because you are going to lead your bore. So in this case, I suggest you to pull that bullet with a bullet worm, but use a bullet worm that is exactly matching your bore caliber so you don't scratch the rifling. That's important. In the past years, I tried it both ways and I really have to say that I really did not found any difference. I also had this question to more experienced long range shooters and they also said that it won't, ma won't matter. So whichever is more comfortable for you, use that direction. The next question is coming from another Patreon supporter, Greg Coleman, a hunter friend. So Greg, your question is? I have a question. Are the woods in Hungary available to the public? Can anyone hunt there, provided they meet the Hungarian regulations? I love this question because I have been planning to make a complete film about the Hungarian gun laws for a long time now. But uh, let's answer this question here before I go for a longer video about this complete topic. In Hungary, the right of hunting is connected to the ownership of the land. There are state-owned territories where Hungarian state-owned forestry and hunting companies are working, and there are private lands which are managed by private hunting clubs. The large majority of these lands are privately owned, and uh, usually they have more owners because for the minimum requirement, you have to have at least 3,000 hectares of land for one hunting club. If a Hungarian citizen wants to hunt, then he must pass the official hunting exam and must have a hunting license. And also, additionally, he must have a firearms license or a muzzle loading hunter's license or a falconer's license or a greyhound hunter's license or a bow hunter's license, which means that all the four traditional hunting methods are welcome in Hungary. The entrance age for hunting used to be 18 years for many, many years, but now it is only 16 years. But these youngsters between 16 and 18, they have to pass the same kind of examination as the elders or the grown-ups, but they cannot possess the firearm, which means that they can only hunt with the close surveillance of the elders. If one is using a modern firearm or a muzzle loader for hunting, then it must meet legal specifications, which means it can be a repeating rifle, it can be a single shot rifle, but it cannot be a semi-automatic rifle or an automatic rifle. It must be a long gun, so handguns are not welcome in Hungary for hunting, and the muzzle energy of the projectile must exceed 1,000 joules for roe deer and 2,500 for red deer, mouflon, fallow deer and wild boar. Semi-auto shotguns are allowed for small game hunting, but you can have only two cartridges in the magazine and one in the chamber. The lead ammunition, the lead shot, is restricted. It is banned on wetlands in Hungary. If a foreigner comes to Hungary, then he must contract a state-owned or a private hunting company. He must have an invitation letter from them, and also he must have the hun Hungarian hunting license for foreigners, which is valid for one month. It is not a big money, by the way. Uh, he also has to, possess, has to possess the national hunting license or firearms license of his own country. Well, this can be tricky sometimes because, for example, in many states of the United States, there are no firearms license for hunters or hunting license. Well, in this case, there must be some creativity in the system. But you can also contact a hunting agency that will guide you through very easily this process. I'm pretty sure that if you come to Hungary, you will find beautiful memories. It's a very good place to hunt. It's a very good place to be. It's a small country, but it has a lot of values. And the next question is from a Patreon supporter also, Roy Keys. Unlike other countries, it appears that Austro-Hungarian had no problem using steel ramrods in steel barrels. I wonder why. <laughs> now, that's an interesting question, but I really have to say that most of the 19th century military muskets and rifles, they do have steel ramrods in nearly all countries. But your concern is right, because steel ramrods do kill the barrel. It is extremely dangerous to the muzzle area and to the first 15 to 10 centimeter rifling just below the muzzle. And if you kill that, your rifle is destroyed. Well, this is the reason why it is very, very hard to find really good military rifles from the 19th century muzzle-loading military rifles with good bores. The Austrian army started to care for the barrel when they switched to the model 1854 Lorenz rifle muskets. These guns were expensive and slow to manufacture. So they started to protect the rifling with covering the tip of the ramrod with a brass band. Now, this was supposed to save the rifling when the steel ramrod is inserted into the muzzle. But in fact, the muzzle was still in danger. Because even if the tip of the ramrod was covered in a brass band that would save the rifling, it could still touch the muzzle, which means it could still destroy it. 
Luckily, the Austrians never really cared about teaching the soldiers how to shoot accurately, which means that they received only 10 to 15 cartridges per year for practice, including just the drill and very little for target shooting. And now we start with the YouTube questions. Okay, so the first one is from Mr. Fancy Pants, and he's asking, what would be a brand of or a gun you recommend for starters that is affordable but good? Now, that's a very good question. I'm a father, I have a beautiful little son who is going to start shooting. So that question is my question as well. And I have the answer for that. First of all, what I suggest is to start with a Kaplock rifle that is firing a patched round ball. That's the easiest one. It's very forgiving. It does not care about the quality of the powder and I'm pretty sure that you will find joy. Recoil is small, so it is a good rifle. It's a good start. And it does not really matter which brand he will choose. There are cheap guns, there are medium price guns, and there are expensive guns, but they all will shoot well with a patch round ball. Now, the one important question here is whether the gun is proof tested or not. So don't buy anything that was not manufactured for being a firearm. So go for a real firearms making company or a, a real firearms making artisan craftsman. These guns are easy to handle. They will be accurate up to 100 or 150 meters. If the rifling is good, then they will handle also short conical bullets. And uh, I really have to say that if you take care of, the, that, of that barrel, it will serve you for a lifetime. So probably not for a lifetime, but you can give it to your grandson and he will still be able to shoot with it. There is a funny saying in Hungary that I'm not rich enough to buy cheap things. And I think that is true for rifles as well, muzzle loading rifles as well. So if I were you, I would go for a rifle like, for example, the Predersoli Scout rifle in 45 caliber. Now, that's a beautiful rifle. It has a one turn in 48 inch barrel, which means that it will handle conicals and the patch round ball as well. It has a shorter barrel. It is technically a short Kentucky rifle. It has a, a, a set trigger system. In 45 caliber, you can find plenty of, of stuff for that, so you don't have a problem with the projectile. I think that's a good choice. It has a very little recoil. It will work with light loads for target shooting, and it will also be good for hunting as well. So to answer your question, this is the rifle I recommend, and this is the one that I'm going to give to my son. The next question comes from Nickelbickel from YouTube. Your favorite gun you own? <laughs> the last one, of course. But no, of course there are some rifles that are much closer to my heart than the others, but I cannot just designate one. So from each category, I have my favorite. So I will now choose one, and then if you are more interested, then we can carry on this discussion later. When I was a child, we were always playing cowboys and Indians. So which means that for me, the rifle is the lever action rifle. The rifle I take most often to the range is my trusty old Uberti 1873 Winchester or lever action sporting rifle. Now, this was my first lever action rifle and I still have to say that it is my absolute favorite. This is an out of box rifle. It has a button rifling and the caliber is 4440 and I charge my cartridges with black powder, of course. And I have been shooting this rifle for more than 15 years now, and it is still a tech, dri tech driver. The only modification I made to this rifle is changing the backhorn sign to this leather type, which is uh, usually visible on the carbine versions. But this is much, much, much better for my eyes because it is around five centimeters further from my eyes, so I have a much clearer sight picture, which is better for hunting as well. This is not the strongest rifle ever, not, not the strongest cartridge ever. The action is the toggle link action, which will not handle large powder loads, but a full case of black powder can still do the job for a smaller game like the roe deer, for example. That's a big game in Hungary, but it's small. That's, it's, it's a bit smaller than white tail deer, for example. Uh, this rifle is, uh, is an excellent shooter. I have won many national championship titles with that, but the best fun, the best fun is shooting this rifle to longer ranges. So if I really, really want to have fun, then I take 50 cartridges with me and I go out to the range and shoot it to 300 yards or 300 meters on metal plates. And there is no better things. Okay, there are some better things, but this is very, very good. When you hear that metal plate ring at 300 yards from a 4440 round fired from an open sight rifle like this. Well, beautiful. The next question is coming from YouTube as well. My Six Senses Gamertag asked the following question. How long does it take to accurize your guns? So if you are black powder shooters, then you will never ever stop experimenting with new loads. 
It does not matter if you found the right load for your rifle or your pistol. It can be a hole in hole group. You will still be experimenting with new ones. You will try out new powders, new bullets, new weds, new lubrication, new caps, and you will never finish that. And to tell you the truth, that's the fun in it. That experimenting and the heureka feeling at the end, well, that's part of the game. Sometimes it takes one week to find the right load for a rifle, but sometimes I'm working on it for more than two or three months. So when you see a widow made by cap and ball and you see that the rifle is putting the bullets into the same hole or nearly into the same hole, well, usually there's a two, three months or sometimes even more work behind it. But I have a different approach when I'm developing a load for hunting than when I'm developing a load for target shooting. When I'm looking for a load for target shooting, I start with minimal powder charges and I start building it up just up until the point when it will start to group. I don't want to have a heavy recoil. I don't want to waste powder on a gun that I'm shooting a lot for the paper target. If I'm looking for a load for hunting, then we have certain rules. As I mentioned to you before, you have to have 2,500 joules of muzzle energy. That's a lot for any kind of gun, for your black powder gun, for your muzzle loader as well. So I will have to start with a very strong load. And I will start to find, I try, we try to find a reasonable group. So if, uh, if the rifle groups at 75 meter in, let's say, a 5 to 10 centimeter group, I will accept it for hunting. It's okay for hunting. I would not accept it for target shooting, but for hunting, that will be good. But I will have to have the enough killing power that is enough for the low and enough for the ethical kill of the game. And the second is much more important. The next question comes from Carl Henning from YouTube. What is your favorite single shot military rifle of circa 1870-1890s? What else, ladies and gentlemen, than the Austro-Hungarian Wendel rifle? And this is, ladies and gentlemen, the model 1867 per 77 version. The caliber is 1115 by 58 r And this was the first small caliber breech-loading metallic cartridge rifle of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. And this was also the rifle for the freshly established Royal Hungarian Army from 1868. The Wendel Holub system which is technically a steel drum with an axis that is in line with the bore axis, is a very strong mechanism, but probably not as good as the bolt action system of, of, for example, the German Mauser 1871 rifle that could easily be converted to a repeater. Well, this was much more difficult for the Vandal Holub rifles. But this was probably not that big problem as all the nations were forced to change the rifles at the second half of the 80s to guns firing smokeless powder cartridges. So all the black powder stuff went down the drain. But the Vandal, at the time of its acceptance, it was a very, very straightforward and very, very modern rifle. And uh, it's still a strong action. By the way, it served in the First World War as well. Of course, in the hands of second line troops, but it was there. The next question is about bullet alloying, and it comes from the YouTube as well, from J Shorter 4716. And the question is, is there any advantage of using alloy bullets when paper patching? I would not connect this question only to paper patching, but rather to the weight of the charge and the velocity of the bullet. When the muzzle velocity of your projectile will arrive to 360, 380 meters per second, that is around 1200 or 1250 feet per second, your soft lead alloy bullet will tend to jump the rifling, which will cause leading. So this is why we are adding tin to the bullet to harden its alloy, and this is why we are using the paper patch. So we could also think that the paper patching will solve the issue of leading, but this is not the only cause why we are alloying the lead with the tin or with other, any other hardeners. Well, if you're propelling your bullet with 90 to 100 grains of powder, that's a huge power, that's a huge gas pressure, that will upset your bullet into the bore, which means that your bullet will deform. Your bullet will be shorter and it will be thicker to fill the rifling completely. Now, the amount of this deformity is dependent on the alloy of your bullet, on your hardness of your bullet and the weight of your charge, of course. So when we are actually alloying the bullet and we are casting it from hardened alloy, then we are actually also saving its ballistic shape. So we are saving its good ballistic coefficient. So that's all for today, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be back with a new question and answer session in two weeks. If you have a question to me, then you can ask it on Patreon. Remember, if you're a Patreon supporter, your question will surely be answered. But you can also put your question down in the comment section in the pinned post under this video. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. 
Until next time, stay cool and keep your powder dry.